Hear the word of the Lord from Acts 25, 1 through 12. Now three days after Festus had arrived in the providence, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul. And they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summons him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied to Paul, was being kept in Caesarea, and that himself intended to go there shortly. So he said, let the men of authority among you go down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day he took the seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the laws of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, and you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for to which these charges against me, but if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he conferred with his council, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. This is the word of the Lord. Do you have permission to stand there and preach? I have all the permission I need. These are conversations that uh, I've had, even as recently as yesterday, and I've seen it firsthand. If you don't know your rights, people are very happy to take them from you. Today, we're going to see the Apostle Paul making a good and full use of his rights, and he did this in a pagan world under Nero, a king who would eventually proved to be one of the worst enemies of the church and one of the worst uh, emperors in Rome. But the Apostle Paul wisely made use of his rights and exercised them to the glory of God. So why should you care? So what? Because sometimes people will try to alienate you from your rights. Because maybe they don't like what you're saying. Uh, occasionally, I've seen it. It comes from overzealous and sadly untrained law enforcement who are happy to deprive you of your First Amendment rights. What do we know? Our Lord created this universe. And He has commanded the church to proclaim the gospel everywhere. In the highways, in the byways, in our conversations... We have all the permission we need to preach the gospel. It comes from the creator of the universe. Thankfully, we have something here in America called the First Amendment. Not every nation in the world enjoys it. But it was predicated on this idea that we need to be able to proclaim the truth. And we need to be able to speak it in the public forums. You don't just have to hide your faith in the four walls of the church. Some of you know we had a little outing yesterday, and I want to affirm and thank the San Diego Police Department who protected my free speech rights when I was surrounded by some Antifa and Black Lives Matter folks who tried to impose what we call the heckler's veto. Thankfully, my rights were upheld and my person protected, and praise God for that. As believers, we need to know our inalienable God-given rights, and looking around the room, 
We need to secure them for our children and for our children's children. Why? Because we have a job to do. We have to preach the gospel. And thank God we live in America where at least for now we can do it lawfully, publicly, boldly if we dare show up. We're continuing today our study in the book of Acts. Some of you are uh, dropping in here for the first time, so let me give you some context. And by the way, it's interesting, there's a lot in the book of Acts given to this kind of episode, and I think we should just let the repetition and the emphasis of Scripture do its work. So rather than skipping over, we're just going to drill down, and even though some of this will sound familiar, it's here for your edification. Remember, falsely accused of bringing Gentiles into the Jerusalem temple and violating the sanctity of the temple, a Jewish mob attempted to murder Paul right there in the holy place of God. Paul was rescued by the Romans, and in an attempt to try to get to the bottom of what happened, they hauled Paul into court before the Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin, and the high priest. But... The proceedings there also became violent, and the Romans had to shuttle Paul away again to safety. The next day, 40 Jewish zealots took an oath. They were going to murder Paul and ambush him, so they enlisted the help of the Sanhedrin to have the Romans bring back uh, Paul to 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 the council or to the courts so that they could assassinate him on the way. And then, in God's good providence, Paul's own nephew heard about the plot, told it to the Romans. The next thing we know, Paul is given a military escort out of Jerusalem to Caesarea. Caesarea was the the regional seat of Roman power over Judea, right on the coast. Then, there was a trial. And Paul was put on trial before Felix. Felix was the governor at that time, notorious for his cruelty and his greediness. And even though the Jews made their case, they had no evidence. They had no proof. And Paul should have rightly, justly, been released at that point. But that's not what Felix did. Greedy Felix, in an attempt to want to please the Jews... And in hopes of getting a bribe, threw Paul into jail, even though he was innocent. He sat there for two years. Can you imagine? Now, we pick up the story. If you look there in your notes, you will see there's a new sheriff in town. Now, three days after Festus had arrived in the province... He went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. Well, who is Festus? Festus, uh, that's a great name, right? And what does it mean? It sounds just like it means. It's festive. He's the happy guy, right? So, but he's not just that. At this point, he's the fixer. He's got to come in and replace feckless Felix, who, remember, he was a slave, Felix was, and Very impressively, as far as we know, the only one to ever do it, he became the governor of a whole region in the Roman Empire. But he could never undo, I think, that slave mentality. He was cruel, he was greedy, he was avarice. And he made a huge mess of what was going on there. And there was so much corruption and excessive brutality, even the Romans thought, we got to get rid of this guy. By the way... Felix was selective in his brutality. He was, he was brutal to his own citizens. And by the way, the whole countryside of Judea was run by these, what we call the Sicarii, remember, the assassins. These, and so there was this huge criminal enterprise outside of the city limits. Remember, Felix and his wife of adultery, Drusilla, summoned the Apostle Paul. And we looked at that last week. And they wanted to discuss with him the matters of faith in Christ Jesus. 
and they dialogued about three things, righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment, and Felix became in Bibio is what it says in the Greek. He became alarmed. He became afraid having heard the gospel. So Felix, in there in your notes, refused to accept the gospel and remained a slave to the world, the flesh, and Drusilla. Now along comes Festus. Festus was not a slave. <laughs> They, they learned their lesson. So Festus was this guy of noble birth. He was, a, he was a Roman insider. He was an aristocrat. He was one of the one percenters. And he wanted to come and restore order. And the Jews, being very smart, understood that made him vulnerable to manipulation. A man of action, Festus, did come and very aggressively and decisively uh, cleaned things up and, and he took authority over the countryside and the assassins and the bandits that were running amok. When a messianic imposter showed up and led a multitude into the wilderness, Festus acted with alacrity and actually had that imposter killed. So to let the Jews know who is in charge, though, Felix then is going to make a show of force, a show of power. So within three days of coming into Caesarea, Felix does something. He marches straight into Jerusalem, the heart of Jewish culture, the heart of Jewish religious power, and frankly, the hotbed of all the turmoil that was corrupting Judea. The city, Jerusalem that killed the prophets, we we're told in Scripture, was also killing Romans. And they were killing each other. And we know the deep state, the Jewish authorities of the Sanhedrin, were wishing for nothing more. Let's just preserve the status quo. We want to keep our jobs, right? Keep the money coming in. So they hoped to create an alliance with Festus. And sadly, though, we see Festus died within four years. But here we see Festus, so just trying to get this in your mind. He's coming in for his victory lap. He's the new sheriff in town. He's in charge, and he wants to let them know his power. So now, with that in mind, let's see how this goes down for the Apostle Paul. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews, verse 2, laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, they urged Felix, or Festus, excuse me. So interesting, Festus does what all politicians do. Uh, he, first, he goes to the, to, into Jerusalem, and notice in your text there, he says he met, met with the high priests. Did you know there was more than one high priest? Well, not one more than one at a time officially, but you had other people who had that office who was still in the area. And he met with the, the members of the elite. The high priest at the time, by the way, his name was Ishmael. And he had been appointed by another governor. We don't know a lot about Ishmael, only that he was very rich. He was a prosperity priest, apparently. And uh, enjoyed the support of the people. Interestingly enough, they took a delegation of the, the elites of Jerusalem to go up to meet with Caesar, and Ishmael was one of them, but guess what happened? They took Ishmael captive and held him prison, prisoner. And by the way, at the end of the Jerusalem War in, 19, in 70 AD, they beheaded Ishmael in Rome. The Mishnah says something interesting. It states that Ishmael's death, with Ishmael's death, the glory of the high priesthood departed. So something great is happening in what's happening in the people of God. 
In 70 AD, Jerusalem will fall, the, the, the temple will come down, and the glory will depart. The kingdom of God will be established in its fullness, and even the Jews themselves admit that the glory on the high priesthood disappeared. Why? Because we have a greater and better high priest in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a greater temple in the Lord Jesus Christ. The economy of redemption, the old covenant is passing away, and even the Jews admitted that. And so here's Festus, he's meeting with all the power players, and he's trying to create an alliance and expand his power base as much as he could. But his weakness was, we see in verse 6, Festus was wishing to please the Jews with a favor. He went in weak, right? If you're vulnerable and you're needing to earn favor, guess what? People sensed that, and they picked up on it, and the Jews understood what was going on. Now remember, what was top of their mind? Was it all the violence that was going on around in Judea? Was it all of the, the violence that was going on in Jerusalem, all these people getting murdered and assassinated? No, they were obsessed. They were preoccupied. It had been two years, and they still could not get the Apostle Paul off their mind. I hope that's our reputation, that... We are so effective for Christ that we stand for Christ with such boldness and courage that the gospel goes forth and people cannot get the gospel and the kingdom out of their mind. So after two years, notice verse 3, asking as a favor, so they recognize he's vulnerable for this, they ask for a favor against Paul that he might summon him to Jerusalem because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. So the, the Jews, again, trying to exploit the honeymoon with Festus, as he's getting started, ask for Paul to be sent to them. Why? Because a, a change in venue would make him vulnerable to ambush. Now that should sound familiar, right? That's what they tried earlier. They tried to ambush Paul, but the Jews found out about it and rescued Paul. But there's a major difference here now. Remember, in the last time, it was the 70, what I'd call roughneck, redneck, uh, zealot patriots who came up with the idea, let's assassinate Paul. And then he, they went to the Sanhedrin and said, ask for Paul to be sent and we'll do the deed and we'll assassinate him. But now it's not the outsider, roughneck, redneck patriots. It's the shepherds of Israel. It's the pastors. It's the religious leaders. The political leaders. The people entrusted with the spiritual and political oversight of the people of God who are now have owned that plot and have internalized it and are now initiating murder against an innocent person in violation of everything the Scripture teaches. So what does that teach us today? Religion does not always improve a person. I know that's politically incorrect. After all, all religions are good. All religions are essentially teaching the same thing. We're, we're told this all the time. But is that true? Religion can turn some people into suicide bombers. Yesterday, as we were standing down in San Diego, whether you realize it or not, the people that are involved in the LGBTQ lifestyle, it's really a religious movement. If you will, I hate, I hate to say it out loud, it's a sex cult. And they were as obscene and as, as violent as they thought they could get away with yesterday. Their religion didn't make them better. And I, I know it's not politically correct to say, but I challenge you to do your own research. Who can stand up to scrutiny of the major world religions? Have you read the stories of Muhammad? Do you know what he did? You need to know that. He was a violent and perverse man. Oh yeah, and so was Buddha. And so the only person to ever be able to stand up 
to the highest and greatest scrutiny, morally speaking, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus was being challenged, and Jesus turned around and said, Who among you reproves me of sin? And even his enemies could not find a legitimate charge against him. So, religion for the sake of religion may or may not have a good effect on you. Why? Because we need Christ. We need Christ in all of his glory. We need Christ to come and change our hearts. We can become self-righteous, arrogant, condescending Christians. Totally contrary to Christ. We need God to come and change us and renew us and to slay our old fallen natures. So we can see religion in itself is not necessarily a good thing. Now remember Festus is trying to to please the Jews, they, they have a murderous plot, and, uh, and we'll see it should come as no surprise because I believe God was helping Paul for Paul to realize, wait a minute, this is not good. And we're going to see how God works, even with religious leaders and political leaders conspiring together, yet God will have his way. So let's talk a little bit about double jeopardy. Thankfully, in the United States, according to our Constitution, when we take, turn, take time to obey it, you cannot prosecute a person more than once for the same offense. In most cases, that's the, the rule. The Fifth Amendment says, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. Thank God for that. That's the result, by the way, of Christian judicial theory being brought to bear into our culture. But in Rome, that wasn't the case. Paul had already been tried and been found innocent, but they didn't get the result they wanted, so they're going to try him again. But that's an abuse. It's an abuse of justice. It's an abuse of courts to try to prosecute somebody twice for the same crime. But of course, we see it happening, unfortunately, in our modern degraded judicial system. People and governments are engaging in what's called lawfare. I don't know if you've heard that word. Lawfare. And by the way, why do they do that? Because even if they're unsuccessful, the process is the punishment. They will bring charges that they know you are wrong. They will sue people and then force them to defend themselves all the way into bankruptcy. I don't want to get into my issue, but I've, I've been affected by this. What about our dear friend Troy Newman? He is being sued right now successfully by Planned Parenthood for $18 million. For doing what? Catching them committing felonies. And the judicial system is turned against them, against Troy, for exposing that they were sell selling baby body parts, which is a felony. And it was an open secret, and he documented it. And for doing what is right and good, the courts were manipulated and used to bring an $18 million judgment against him. The courts, that's why we need Christian judges. We need Christian attorneys. We, we cannot hand this over to the ungodly and expect them to not abuse power. Paul ought to have been released by Felix two years earlier. They had failed to convict him. But in order to curry the favor of the Jews, Paul is being used as a political pawn. Verse 4, Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, he said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against them. So Festus, again, trying to please them, uh, tries to throw them a bone. And, uh, but the decision is interesting how he makes it, right? It's all more or less driven by pragmatism. It was simply more convenient for the Jews to come down to Jerusalem to Caesarea for, for Festus. 
Plus, there's probably a little posturing going on, right? It's the lessers that come to the greater, not the greater to the lesser. And he's trying to put, got to put them in their place. Oh, you want to have a trial? That's fine. You come to me. You come to me on my terms. But Festus, unwittingly, is doing the will of God. By that decision, he's delivering Paul from the murderers. Because they wanted Paul to go to him. Festus changed it, probably, frankly, out of a little bit of human pride. I hope that encourages you, because note how God used the selfish motives of fallen men to further his purpose. Sometimes I know we're frustrated, we look around and we, oh Lord, how long will the wicked prosper? And we understand the laments of the scripture, but be assured, God is at work and he will even use ungodly motives of ungodly people to be able to advance his agenda in the earth. But there's good news for us here today, spiritually speaking. There is no divine double jeopardy. And we should rejoice in that today. Based upon God's nature, he is holy, he is just, perfect in all he does. As a believer, you can know that in Jesus Christ there is absolutely no chance of any condemnation coming to you. If you have repented and believed on Christ, you have eternal life. That's what Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. That's amazing. So Christ's death on the cross, His resurrection from the dead, is a once-for-all event. Christ paid every last cent for every last sin of every last believer who is trusting on Him. And because God is just, God cannot and will not punish sin twice. No double jeopardy. The Lord laid upon Him, that is Christ, the, the iniquity of us all. He is our suffering servant, and He paid the price for our redemption. And God grants all who believe on Christ full immunity from the curse of the law and full deliverance from the second death, which is the lake of fire. The Apostle Peter put it this way, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by His wounds, you have been healed. That'll even make a Presbyterian say amen. Any Presbyterians out there? So by nature and by our actions, we were all sitting on death row. Then came the greatest news that your sin-weary heart has ever heard. An acceptable sacrifice has come, even one who is without spot and without blemish. And our Christ interposed His precious blood. And the sentence of death that I deserved and that you deserved, He absorbed. Praise be to God. You are no longer in jeopardy if you will only repent and believe. And so today, have you? Have you repented of your sins? Have you put your faith in Christ? Will you let Him remove your jeopardy so that you will not have to stand condemned before God? Being freed from the curse of the law, you are now empowered to live a life of gratitude in accordance with the commandments of Christ to the glory of God. And that is our testimony for all of us who are in Christ. Let's continue. Verse 6, And then he stayed with them not more than eight or ten days, and he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he took his seat 
on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. And when he arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against them that they could not prove. So the trial convenes. They go down to Caesarea. The Jews make serious charges, but produce no proof and no witnesses. And just a little aside here for you uh, Bible nerds. Notice you always descend from Jerusalem. Well, how is that possible? Caesarea was to the north. Didn't they go up to Caesarea? No, you're thinking, you're not thinking biblically. You got to understand, Jerusalem was a picture of Eden. It was a picture of the mountain of God. It's a picture of the new heavens and the new earth. And so Mount Zion, you always ascend to Mount Zion. And you, when you leave Jerusalem, no matter whether you're going north, south, east, or west, you always descend from Jerusalem. And that speaks to us, right? Because it is from the Mount of God that the rivers of blessing flow to the earth. Where the, the free grace of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the, the mercies of God flow from the throne of God. That's always the imagery in the Bible. And that also helps you to understand theologically how to think about the rest of the world. Because now we, we stand under a heavenly Zion, right? We, we worship God who sits in a city whose builder and maker is God, not a, not a city made by hands. And everything is under that authority. It's the high city. And so Caesarea, they descended from Mount Zion down to Caesarea. What does Caesarea mean? Caesar town. Caesar is under Jehovah. Caesar is under Christ. You have to think of that. That's how the Bible conceives that. And we see they descended from where God dwells down to where Caesar's authority was. Note the, the trial here. It's really out of order. It says the, circle, uh, the Jews circled Paul and just started hurling charges at him. <laughs> I had the joy of going to jury duty this week. That was crazy. Fortunately, they don't do that in our courts. And yet, here they are, like a pack of wolves, but they're just doing what they did last time. They're defaming him, they're slandering him, and they're bullying him, but they have no evidence and they have no proof. Remember, that there was three charges that were brought against Paul, and the original three charges were still false. They accused Paul of being a commander of a violent insurrectionist group called the Nazarenes. And, they, and Paul had gone around the Roman Empire stirring up trouble, political trouble. And that Paul was sacrilegious. He had violated the sanctity of the temple. But look in verse 8, here's Paul's defense. And Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I committed my offense. Paul basically denies all three charges, and the Jews have no evidence. You would think, okay, slam dunk. Justice will be served. No, what are we going to see? Lady Justice is about to get mugged mugged by her arch nemesis, pragmatic politics. Thankfully, we don't see any of that happen today, right? Verse 9. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? Huh. So Festus, again, playing to the Jews looking like he's willing to play ball, throws the Jews a bone. And notice, Festus says, hey, I'll even come up and adjudicate the case. If you're the Apostle Paul, I don't think that would be, have been very comforting. Why? Well, first of all, what he had just experienced. But what do we know of our Lord? The Romans were the ones that oversaw the trial of our Christ. 
The Romans are the one that were responsible for the un most unjust act in the history of the universe. The only innocent man to ever walk planet Earth was first found not guilty, right? But because of the insistence of the mob, Pilate frees a notorious insurrectionist and murderer by the name of Barabbas. And then Pilate hands over our Lord, the one and the only innocent, sinless, impeccable Christ to be crucified. I don't know about you, if I was Paul, knowing what they had done to Christ, having that offered, let's go up to Jerusalem and I'll, I'll adjudicate it. I think not only did the Holy Spirit give Paul wisdom, just common sense says, that's, that's not necessarily a good thing. So finally, what do we see? We see a rightful appeal. But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself very, know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Paul knew better than to go up to Jerusalem, and if it could be avoided, he wanted to avoid it, and thankfully it could be. But he knew what was going on. Festus was willing to give him up to the Jews in a heartbeat, even if that meant him finally being convicted of some spurious crime. That is, if, if Paul survived the trip to Jerusalem and wasn't assassinated along the way. But the right of a Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar was an absolute right. And so Festus had no choice. Praise God. To Caesar, Paul appealed, and to Caesar, he will go. Well, some of you know your history. <laughs> was that really a smart thing to do? Why? Who was Caesar at the time? Wasn't it to vicious Nero to whom Paul appealed? You're going, wow. <laughs> Did he jump out of the fire, uh, fire, frying pan into the fire? Anyone familiar with Nero's persecution of Christians might be saying, saying, Paul, what are you thinking? What are you doing? And by the way, they will eventually be proven right. Tradition holds that, Christ, uh, that Paul was eventually beheaded in Rome as a martyr for his faith, as part of an execution of Christians ordered by Nero fire, as a result of the great fire of Rome that he blamed on them. And this, according to church tradition, took place in AD 64. But this is earlier. And by the way, this was generally a more stable time of Nero's reign. Nobody had really seen the dark, sadistic side of him at this point. But either way, this was God's providence still at work. Paul is going, yes, in a very unexpected and a very circuitous way to Rome. And this is exactly what we would expect. Why? So after sitting in God's waiting room two years, Paul will bear witness to Rome just as Christ had promised. That should be reassuring to us. God's promises will not fail as we wait. Can you imagine what Paul must have been thinking for two years? We don't know much of what happened during that two-year period while he's in Caesarea. There's just not a record of it. I'm sure he was writing letters. I'm sure he was meeting with people. I'm sure there was ministry going on. But, but, but Paul had the promise of God that he would bear witness to Christ between, before Jews and Gentiles and kings. 
The king's part had not taken place. And now God's promise is starting to come true. Probably not in the way that he imagined it, but God will not fail in his promises to Paul or to you. Maybe you feel like you've been in the waiting room two years, waiting for God's promises to come to pass in your life. Don't give up. Continue to stand. God is faithful. I imagine Festus was a little bit relieved to be able to get Paul off of his agenda, get this troublesome manner out of his hands, but little did Festus know he was just part of the, the puzzle, part of what God was doing to advance the purposes of the kingdom of God. So what does this mean for us today then? So in conclusion, when you act to assert and defend your rights, remember one thing, it's not just about you. We must consider the impact that it will have for our children and for the church and for the kingdom of God. The church needs to be the church. We need to be the salt and light. We are commanded to reprove the unfruitful deeds of darkness. That's what we did yesterday. We're commanded to be the pillar and the ground of truth. That's what we're commanded to do. We have to be able to speak. We need to be able to speak freely and boldly, privately and publicly, wherever we can. It is what Christ has commissioned us to do. And praise God, we can do it here in freedom. Praise God for those who will do it in spite of persecution. I pray that we would be those people. But for the sake of our children and our children's children, and for the sake of the church, and for the sake of our community, we need to contend for and defend and assert our constitutional right of free speech. We are commanded to preach the gospel to everybody, everywhere. And by God's grace, may we become good stewards of our inalienable God-given rights and use them to secure for generations yet unborn these rights so that they can hear and believe and proclaim the gospel. As Paul used his rights to advance his ministry, may we have his same boldness. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Let's pray.